Hey, 30 seconds of notes before beginning. The trailer to the movie Bliss is in the description. Definitely want to see the trailer to this weird movie before listening to this. Have to have some sort of an idea what's going on here. Although the movie's impossible to understand on its own. Thank you to Darla for helping me comprehend this movie. Could Denise M. from BC, Canada please email me? And guys, the next presentation, The History of the World Part Fun, but Part 2... We'll probably go out to everybody that gave their information at No Hobo Code and we'll be available at Free Voice. Hey guys, it's Matt. This is probably the hardest thing I've ever done or the hardest video I've ever had to make. The movie Bliss, Bliss, an Amazon Prime exclusive starring Owen Wilson and Selma Hayek is the strangest, hardest to understand, most in comprehensible, inexplicable movie anybody has basically ever seen. Now, I understand maybe 50 to 60% of you will not have even seen the movie. I have to do this in a way, understanding most of you haven't even seen the movie. This will use the movie Bliss and will be 95% about the movie Bliss, but I'll try to evolve it into an exercise, uh, into thinking big, into thinking outside the bookends. Even people in this community, you watch the movie Bliss, you have no idea, as I had no, I had no idea what I was watching the first time through. You know, and how many, what, what, do, what do the popcorn crunchers think? Hon, what was that I just saw? I don't know, stop complaining about that. Put some sports on with no fans if you don't like the movies Amazon's presenting. Hon, I don't know what I just saw. It's, it's. To a popcorn cruncher, and you, you can see this from the movie reviews, the movie reviews on this movie, Bliss, are so absurd. They're trying to fit the movie review and the understanding of this movie inside their bookends. And the bookends of the average person, it's like one brass bookend smashed into another. There's no room between them for anything. They're, they're trying to talk about... Well, this obviously is a presentation about opioid addiction and mental health problems. Are you kidding me? These movie reviewers, I mean, that's all they can all they can do is come up with what fits inside their tiny their bookends is like between the bookends is like one half of one millimeter. That's all they can it has to fit into their own known reality. It's not about opioid addiction or are you kidding me? It's about worlds colliding, living in different dimensions at the same time. Um, at the minimum, matrix type themes where one world is a simulation, but that's first grade truth in this movie Bliss. So I'm going to do this, guys. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. If you want to treat this like an old-fashioned radio show, put your feet up. I'll turn it in to a, an exercise into thinking big or thinking outside the bookends whenever I can. I'm going to, I'll walk you through the plot because even if somebody's seen it – I've already seen it. I don't need no plot. Even if you've already seen it, you still – I mean, trust me, uh, you need to go through the plot again to understand it. And I'm forced to do this with just a few thumbnails. This will be a challenge. If I pull this off, guys, it'll be a miracle. I'm just starting this recording. I don't know how the way it's going to go. We'll see. Now, in movie reviews, people talk about spoilers and spoiling the plot and what happens. This is the one movie of all time where you want all the spoilers. You want someone to tell you what to look for, what is unfolding. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how smart anybody is in this community. There is no chance that anybody can watch this movie for the first time and get a sense as to what's going on. It is that bizarre and all over the place. You actually want as many spoilers as possible and me pointing as many things out as possible if you're going to watch the movie. I'm telling you because it's a waste of time to watch it the first time. You'll have no idea what's going on. That being said, if anybody's saying, well, why should I waste my time with this movie, Matt? Maybe it is just an all-over-the-place mess. Maybe it's just put out to have a hundred different interpretations. There's no underlying metaphysical truth of reality being delivered. I wouldn't have spent as much time on it as I did if I didn't believe there wasn't tremendous underlying 
truth in this movie. I sniffed it the first time I watched it. I had no idea what I was watching. The second time I watched it, it came out. It's there. I'm telling you, the underlying truth is there. And just to give you, I, I can't prove it now, but I'll just give you one example. The details put into the background, the like how one world merges with another and the details carried forth, it's not something they would do if they just made some movie that's just out to confuse and they really don't care what the underlying messages or there wasn't, you know, creepy backroom underlying truth to anybody stumbling upon this uh, video or this review from the outside looking for a movie review of bliss. Um, the people here, we study the underlying fabric of how reality works. Sometimes it's called dark reality. You won't understand a lot of what I discuss when we go down these paths, if you're just coming for a movie review of Bliss, but trust me, listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. We're not crazy here. We've done the research. The average person looking for a movie review on Bliss is not going to understand a lot of what I'm about to present, but if you want some bullcrap fake review, go over to Rotten Tomatoes. It's called Rotten for a reason. The reviews are rotten and fake. Star Wars, The Force Awakens, 94%. Are you kidding me? Eighth graders in a, in a Dungeons and Dragons club could storyboard that freaking movie better than Disney did. Okay, it's time to do a five or seven minute plot overview. Now, for those that have seen it once or twice, I can't imagine anybody not needing another plot overview. But if you just don't want to go through the plot overview, because there'll be little discussion of truth, little discussion of what is being presented, it's simply plot what the movie is presenting without an underlying discussion. This will be about five, seven, eight minutes. I will put a timestamp now in the video to tell you when you want to come back again after this plot review is done. I'll do this in a way that to make it as entertaining as possible, but it's so bizarre. It will be hard for me to do this. Okay. The movie begins. And if you plan to see it, oh, I don't want to listen to this because it's a spoiler. You need this. Trust me. There's no spoiler possible with this movie. The movie begins with Owen Wilson. He's in this uh, you know, job you could tell he doesn't like. The phones are ringing, some sort of telemarketing. He's pulled into the boss's office, fired. He accidentally kills the boss. He gets upset. He like pushes the boss, and the boss falls back, dies. And then he tries to cover it up, like hides the body behind a curtain and gets out of there. Okay, it's a very strange start, but it's just like this telemarketing company. They're just trying to help customers with their same reading from the same scripts. You can tell it's just a job that he doesn't like. Goes across into the bar for some reason, across the street. Goes across across the street into the bar, which is what anyone would do after they just killed their boss. And he's ordering a whiskey. <laughs> you think he'd be fleeing like Lee Harvey Oswald into maybe a movie theater, but there's Selma Hayek staring at him. And he looks over and he's like, why is this woman staring at me? And she makes some funny gestures or some strange gestures with her hands like she's some sort of witch casting a spell. And the lights behind start flickering, but nothing's happening. Flickering lights. Zzz, 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 zzz. And he's like, what are you staring at? And she basically is like, you're real. You're actually real. You're one of the few people here that are real. Of course, he has no idea what she's talking about. You're one of the only people here that are real. She invites him over to sit down. She's sitting in a booth in the bar. Come sit with me. Come sit down. You need help. You need an alibi. He's like, what? Like, he's thinking, oh, how would she know I need an alibi? And what's he doing in the bar anyway, right? So he goes over and he sits down with her. And she's like, I can help you. You need an alibi. He knows that she knows about what he just did to the boss and then stuffed him behind a curtain. He's like pressed up against a window. She's like, I feel obligated to help you, Owen Wilson. He's like, well, why? Because I basically created this world or I helped create this world. Of course, he has no idea what she's talking about. And he just, just, let's just go with it. You know, he says, hold, hold hands. But maybe at this point, she appears to be some sort of witch with powers. He's desperate. So they hold hands in this booth in the bar across the street from the telemarketing company where he just killed his boss. The boss is stuffed up against the window. They can actually see the boss out their window. They look up three floors. He's dead behind a curtain stuffed against the window. Owen Wilson's like, well, how's she going to help me? Anyway, I feel obligated to help you because I created this world. All of a sudden, the window opens of the third floor across the street, the window where the boss is stuffed behind the curtain, and he falls out the window, splats against the sidewalk. Well, everybody comes running. Of course, it looks just like a suicide. 
Then Greg, Owen Wilson, goes running across the street. People he know from work, um, the guy, his name is Bjorn. Bjorn just committed suicide. And she walks over with him and she's like, we need to get out of, the, out of here. He's like, well, how did you do that? How did you just create that situation? She's like, I'll explain later. Come with me. Come with me. I'll take you to, I forget how she puts it, my home between worlds or my home away from home. She's like a, you don't know what to make of her. She could be a witch. She turns out she's like a vagrant, you know, maybe homeless. I don't know. There's, but there's a, a mystical nature of the Selma Hayek character. So he did just kill his boss 30 minutes before, although it seems to have the perfect alibi now. He says, okay, I'll go with you. So as they're walking back, she lives in a, like a tent city for homeless, I guess next to the L.A. River or wherever they are. Um, it's Phoenix or L.A., you know, the dry bed rivers, all the tents of all the homeless. She has a big tent there. She's explaining to him how this whole world isn't real. She uses the term, and the movie uses the term, FGP, fake generated person. Well, there you go. That's our or our community's NPC non-player character. Did they steal it? Matt, are you saying they stole it from the truth community? And they, oh, absolutely. They stole it from the truth community. No doubt about it. They use FGP, fake generated person. And she has, she still has that, you know, the Selma Hayek, the thick accent. She's quite a caricature in this world. Just when they get to the other world, the more sophisticated bliss world, she's much more serious. She's not as fun. It's a different Selma Hayek in that world, but we'll come to that later. Did I say five to eight minutes? This could be 10 to 15 minutes. I will put the timestamp again as to when it will finish. Um, saying, come with me. And as they talk, this world's not real. These people aren't real. Comes back to their tent city where she lives as a homeless person. And she is saying these orange, basically in a a 30 minute scene into one minute, these orange crystals uh, give me power over this world, which is a world, a fake world, a generated matrix of some kind. She's saying I helped create the first place, but see these orange crystals here, Greg, give me direct power over this world. And she kind of teaches him to use the power. They light candles and then turn candles off just by pointing at the candles or with their mind. She can levitate objects, things like that with these orange crystals. Of course, orange crystal, the orange is associated with this world or that, that lower level world, the way the movie starts in a world that looks like the more uglier parts of our world. There's no question that the orange crystal or the color of it is significant. Talk about that on the back end. So she's teaching him how to use these powers, the powers of the orange crystals. She said, you have these drawings too. I forgot to mention the beginning of the movie, he's sitting in his office, not doing his job. He's obsessed with drawing these landscapes and these environments and this house and this creek or this pool next to the house. He's, it's a pencil sketch. And she's like, you have these drawings. You know, how does she know? But let me see the drawings. And she's like, the level of detail in these drawings, Greg, is amazing. You know, where did you where did you get this level of detail? He's saying, I don't know. I'm just obsessed with it. It's in my head all the time. I'm obsessed with this house and this environment and this landscape. And she's like, no, Greg, this is your home. This is your real home. This here around you is fake. These people are FGPs, fake-generated people. This is all fake here. And people, as you watch, you start thinking about the Matrix again. She's like, I see you have another drawing here of a woman. And there's a woman in a sexy pose. And of course, it's Selma Hayek. He's like, look at the face, Greg. It's like, you drew me. That's me. You know, we're together in this other world. We're soulmates or married. That's me. And of course, there's no denying when he looks at his own pencil, pencil sketch, he, it is absolutely Selma Hayek. So at this point, he knows there's something very mystical going on and he's going to hang out with her for a while to, to try to get to the bottom of it. Now, up to this part in the movie, there's three significant things that have happened. One is a, a quote or a phrase. She says, Greg, this world here is simply light bouncing around your neurons that you can manipulate. It's uh, the message from her at this point in the movie is this world is overwhelmingly fake and the people you get the sense Almost 95, 98% of people, at least the way Selma Hayek is describing it, are fake. This world is simply light bouncing around your neurons. And you can manipulate this world. And she shows she has a glass, a crystal glass, and light rays are coming into the crystal glass. It's creating a prism and a reflection of colors. It's really the only time in this world you see the prism and the reflection of colors 
kind of like it seems similar to me as the colors presented in the chakras, but I'm no expert at it. Now, this prism of colors is absolutely associated with the next world, which I'll get to in the plot. Okay, this prism of light and colors only appears once in the movie at this point, but is all over the place once they get into the next world or the bliss world. I'll condense the next 30 minutes of the movie into about one minute. They simply run around together having these adventures, for lack of better uh, description. They go to a roller rink, and Greg uses his powers to make people trip, for people that are kind of acting inappropriately. You know, some guy squeezes some girl's butt in the roller rink, and he just points at him, and he trips. And he's like, and she's, of course, the whole time going, don't worry if anybody gets really hurt. These people are all fake. Have fun, Greg, using the power of the orange crystal. So a lot of strange things happen during this time. And they seem to be running around together, getting more and more and more homeless. Um, he has no wallet at this point. He sells his cell phone for $10. They get scruffier and scruffier looking, no shower. And, but you know, they're running around using the power of these orange crystals, looking more and more ragged, becoming more and more homeless. This is about the next 25 minutes of the movie. Uh, I just condensed. Let's move on to the next important segment. Now, everything that's happened thus far happened in what looks to the viewer or the audience like looks like our world. It's just Los Angeles, you know, 2020, 2021. At some point, the movie completely changes when they go into that other world, the world associated with the blue crystal, the bliss world. This world or where we are in the movie now is associated with the orange crystal. Yes, I believe that's highly significant. But one important thing to talk about before... They, the movie makes the transition to the bliss world or the blue crystal world is Owen Wilson has a family. Now he lost his job. He killed his boss, but he's becoming more and more homeless. He's becoming a vagrant, but he does have a daughter and a son. The daughter highly cares about him. And we kind of just get the assumption as the movie goes on that the daughter is, must be hearing things like he misses the graduation. She probably finds out he lost his job. So she starts like pursuing him. The f cell phone number doesn't work. Maybe he hears rumors that he's roaming around the streets. She very much cares about him. And she is a highly convincing from a, even from an actor or actress perspective. She does a great job and plays a great role. Without this role, I'll try to tie this together at the end. You would not, you know, you wouldn't have this conflict as to which world was real to the first level truth or watching on the first time. And I, I don't, I'm not trying to run anybody down. I thought this the first time. Everybody would think this the first time. But you just think the blue crystal world is the real world. This is the matrix. It's not that simple. All right. I'll try to talk about that later. But the daughter is out pursuing him. And he is, you know, she finds him on a street corner. And Selma Hayek's across the street, and it seems like it's just like scoring drugs, but she's scoring these orange crystals from a guy that knows how to make them who's associated with the other world. I'll explain later, the bliss world. But he's on a street corner, solicited for drugs, solicited for certain type of sex, and it's just kind of the daughter sees him, and the daughter, of course, from the daughter's perspective, the father has completely lost his mind. Just like other reviewers of this movie get confused, he's opioid addicted, he's heroin addicted. You know, the, the daughter's like, come back to me, daddy, come back to me. And he's kind of saying, well, the person I'm with who's across the street, she's telling me you're not even real. He's confused, of course, but she's not confused at all. Now, as you watch the movie, we're led to believe she's just an NPC, just an FGP. But no, it's not that simple. Too much emotion, too much r real human being in this daughter um, for, for you can just default to FGP. He has a real life and a daughter that highly cares about him that will be circled back in towards the end of the movie. Again, he's becoming a vagrant. She's out pursuing him. And when she finds him saying, you know, come back to me, here's my phone number. Anyway, it's very important to know that as we move forward. Okay, maybe at 45 minutes in the movie, everything changes. After running around using the power of their orange crystals and their powers and getting arrested and having fun and becoming more and more vagrant, they kind of have it out with each other. She says, you know, Greg, you know, she expects him to kind of realize who he is more. She says, you're being seduced by the illusion. You know, I'm worried about you. You're being sucked into the illusion. 
You're not really understanding who you are. She's thinking he should have a better sense of him understanding who he is. All he knows is he's Greg from this world where he had a telemarketing job, etc. So she, he goes back to her and kind of frustrated. He's like, what is all this shenanigans, all these powers, all this crazy shit you've been throwing at me? He's like, for some reason, he says, I don't believe in you anymore. So she uses the classic line from The Matrix. She says, okay, enough. You have to see it for yourself. You know, Morpheus, you know, The Matrix is not something you can be told about, Neo. You have to see it for yourself. Same thing going on here. You have to see it for yourself. And he's like, well, how do we do that? Well, these blue crystals will uh, help us exit the illusion. We can basically walk out of the matrix with these blue crystals, and she has locked these blue crystals locked away in this safe. This is where the movie changes. At this point, Owen Wilson and Selma Hayek take these blue crystals, which needs to be snorted through the nose, and then everything changes. Greg Owen Wilson wakes up in a lab setting. He wakes up into a completely new world, a completely new reality. And at first he says, yeah, that was all an illusion. He has tubes stuck up his nose. A lab technician comes over and helps him remove the tubes from his nose. There are other people around him under the experiment as well with tubes up their nose in chairs. It's very similar to Neo getting into the chair to enter the Matrix. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of cat screaming here. <laughs> um, so he, everybody watching now believes that, okay, this is the real world. This, this world of the blue crystals is the real world. And what he was in were the, the world that seemed like our world where he killed his boss and the orange crystal world. That was an illusion. That was the matrix, just like Selma Hayek said. And I'm going to pause until the cats are done screaming. It's like what Hannibal Lecter called the screaming of the lambs while he was doing the psychological profile of Clarice. Can anybody watching the movie, you're going, well, yeah, that first world the world that looked like ours, the world of the orange crystals, that was just what uh, I think her name is Isabel said or Selma Hayek said. It was an illusion because here's Greg is woken up in a lab experiment, and that's further confirmed, but it's not confirmed. I'm going to say not so fast, not so fast, thinking the blue crystal world of bliss is the real world and our world was the fake world. Not so fast, even though up to this point the evidence is overwhelming, at least the way the movie presents it, that our world, the orange crystal world of them in the tent city and the homelessness was a fake matrix. Not so fast. But again, if you're watching for the first time, it seems to be confirmed. It just woke up into a lab setting. Then later, Selma Hayek makes a presentation. In our world, the orange crystal world, she's this strange, mystic, homeless, ragged, fun-loving, kind of running around doing crazy things. In the bliss world or the blue crystal world that they just woke up into from the lab experiment, she's a distinguished scientist and doctor doing this highly technical experiment called the brain box of which both of them were just under or in the simulation. She later presents uh, to a huge audience uh, how this brain box works and the results of her experiments and how going into the illusion, going into the simulation, using the brain box to experience this horrible, horrible world, which is just like our world. See, that gets you to appreciate the world we have here, the blue crystal world. And the blue crystal world, as it's presented in the movie, is a blissful looking place. The weather's perfect. Every tree is perfectly healthy. The grass is perfectly cut. Everybody seems friendly. Everybody's dressed nice. The buildings are clean. There's not a bit of trash anywhere. It's kind of like a, you know, old Roman feeling. I don't know. It, but it's, it's, see, to me, I started thinking this world is too perfect. This world seems fake, but you would never, ever go there watching the movie for the first time. I don't think anybody would go there anyway, but because he, he obviously, Matt, well, Matt, he just woke up into a lab. The lab technician removed the tubes from, he, from his nose. The first world was obviously fake. And then in her lecture to the, to the audience, the live audience, Selma Hayek as now the distinguished doctor, she uses her own husband, Greg, as a subject in her experiment, asks him to come out before the live audience and says, we asked Greg a series of questions before he went into the assimilation, before he went into the brain box, before he went into the illusion. And they show his answers to the questions. And he's a little pissed off. He's a little snarky, not appreciative. 
you know, just not the f completely blissful person that emerged from the experiment. They ask him the same questions after he emerges from the experiment, and the answers are just so much different. He's just so thankful to be here. Nothing bothers him. The world is wonderful. And Selma Hayek kind of says, well, this, this proves my, my experiment. This brain box simulation works. You know, he didn't appreciate the world we have here until he went in to the simulation and experienced that hell on earth, the world we have. <laughs> he didn't appreciate it. But look, look at him now. Look at the blissful state he's in. And anybody watching, the concept seems very simple. It's Selma Hayek created a matrix or a simulation that was completely believable where you experience such hardship, hell, crap, pain, this, you know, all this stuff that we experience in this life, then, boy, you really then appreciate the real world once you come out of the illusion and take your blue crystals. And from a very basic truth perspective, somebody screaming at this video might say, well, Matt, that's exactly, you know, my belief as to the situation we're in. We're souls and spirits having this 3D, very low lowly experience because we need to go through this to appreciate the nature of our true selves. We will be much better off going forward once we experience this life. And that is a very simple concept that seems to come out of the movie. It's not simple the first time you watch it. Nothing is when you watch this movie the first time. But there's much more to it than that, in my opinion. And when Owen Wilson emerges from the experiment and it all seems like, oh, that was the matrix, the orange crystal world, our world was the matrix. This is the real world. The real world's a little too perfect, right? Again, everything is perfect. And they show this wonderful weather and every, there's no trash. It's just, and, and you go, this is too perfect. And Selma Hayek's trying to explain, although Greg, he has no memory of this world. See, that's, a, he remembers every bit about the orange crystal world or what's supposed to be a matrix or an illusion. He remembers every bit about his daughter and his son and everything there. And Selma Hayek saying, you're getting lost in the illusion. But what a coincidence. He has no memory at all of what's supposed to be or what Selma Hayek is telling him, the real world, this bliss world, no memory at all, which you have to think, well, that doesn't make any sense. If this is the real world for him, if this is the real world, then his memories, almost 99% of his memories would be here, not in the orange crystal world. And it just gets stranger and stranger. Um, in a conversation where he's having with Selma Hayek saying, tell me about this wonderful place. It's all new to me. I'm, I'm looking forward to experimenting with it all over again. I don't care if I don't have my memory. It'll be great to discover it all over again. She's saying, no, no, it, it wasn't always this nice. It was horrible. This world was horrible. It was full of death and pollution and trash and ugliness. And we, we, we fixed it. We fixed this world that's now so perfect. And he says, Owen Wilson, again, is so confused. He says, well, how did you fix it? How did you turn it into this beautiful thing? And this is where they drop the 33. No question about it. She holds up three fingers and she says, three things fixed it. Holds up three fingers. There's a 33 right there. Holding up the three, but it gets better. And then saying three. He's like, what three things? She says three things fixed it, holds up three fingers. He says, really, three things fixed it? Re repeats the three to the three and holds up three. So there you go. But what she answers with is these three things fixed our entire world. Synthetic biology, um, automation, and asteroid mining. Again, this is significant. This is a world of hell that she says wherever people were dying just walking down the street because of pollution that now appears to be the greatest place ever created. Uh, you know, any, anybody could ever imagine in their, in their most perfect dream of bliss. So w these three things, uh, the asteroid mining, they, they throw in just as, as part of the script. But the other, she says automation, synthetic biology, and asteroid mining. And then, of course, he said, well, explain that. Well, automation, the robots started doing all the menial tasks, cleaning the toilets, doing all the factory work. It gave us time to just, it's like the Star Trek concept. We could pursue uh, the education we wanted or the arts, and we had time to paint, and we had time to take up the guitar because the robots did all the stuff that we used to do. So uh, first thing I thought of is, you know, like the 
robot history or the machine world history in the Matrix and Animatrix. Robots were used for all the menial tasks. Robots started being treated as slaves. Robots then created their own artificial intelligence and rebelled against the humans in the Matrix, which started the whole Matrix thing. So I'm thinking, well, maybe is, is Bliss showing you the start of the Matrix? Is Bliss is Bliss the is is Bliss the origin of the Matrix? And don't think movies aren't tied in. We already, you know, saw how dark city is completely tied in to the matrix. Okay. Then she says synthetic biology and not just for the human being. She alludes to the fact that uh, trees were given new types of biology or DNA strands or whatever trees use. So they can, they no longer, um, you know, they can, they can use the pollution and, you know, synthetic biology was used on everything in the environment to fix everything, you know, where in this presentation from Selva Hayek. It was all used for a good thing. In our orange crystal world that we experience now, we have people like George Soros trying to create Frankenmystee mosquitoes, and you know how that goes. It just gets bad. But apparently this worked in this bliss world. And you're watching this when you watch it a few times, and your truth are going, this is too good to be true. This is bullshit. Um, and then asteroid mining. Well, um, they mine these asteroids and they found gold and rare earth elements. And there's so much money to go around. Just for being a citizen here, you get $500,000, even if you do nothing else. And Greg, you worked on these experiments. You created an experiment called the uh, Thought Actualizer. You just put a TV screen on and you think of things and it shows you what you're thinking about. So isn't this world wonderful? And after watching a few times, you're going, wait a second here. This, this shit's too good to be true. Something's not right here. The other thing of note when they're in the bliss world, the world of the blue crystals, where the distinguished doctor is giving her lectures about her brain box experiments when she's just like homeless person running around in our orange crystal world, what's of note is constant. It looks like a lens flare. And the first time you watch it or anybody that's not in our community watching it wouldn't think much of it. Like they're just trying to create a camera effect to represent this bliss, wonderful world. But every time somebody turns around, it's like a lens flare. There's a, there's a prism of, of light and the, and the spectrum, the Roy G. Biv spectrum, which to me, I just thought, you know, chakras, the colors of the chakras, it's all over the place. It'll, a prism of, of the various colors of the rainbow will, for just a, a moment, beam out of Greg's head as he turns a corner. And it just happens over and over and over again in this bliss world. And the only way to relate that back um, to or the, the only connection that the movie makes from that is back in one of the original scenes in the bar where Greg had just killed his boss in the telemarketing company. He had just met Selma Hayek and she's saying, I feel responsible because I for you, I've got to help you here because I kind of created this world. Once later, you know, we see that Selma Hayek did, as the doctor in charge of these experiments and this research, did create that world. So it seems, she says to Greg, you know, she holds a, uh, she spins her glass as the sun beams into her crystal glass. There's whiskey in the glass. And remember, the prism of, of the rainbow color prism is uh, shown on like the bar top. It's a seedy, crappy little bar. And she says... This world is simply light bouncing around your neurons, and you can manipulate it. You know, this, what she says to Greg upon the first five minutes of meeting him, this world's fake. And the spectrum of colors is, you know, coming out through the, the, the crystal glass. She's just turning back and forth. That same prism of, you know, Roy G. Biv colors, it, it just is all over the place in every single scene in the blissful blue crystal world. It represents um, whatever meaning or truth this movie is trying to get out. The, the rainbow of colors that are just bouncing all over the place in the blissful world um, are is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. Most people that don't watch movies the way we watch movies, like the popcorn crunchers, they wouldn't even notice – I don't think they would even – this comes up a hundred times in the bliss blue crystal world, but they probably wouldn't even notice it. And if they did notice, it would say, that was – Matt, that was a camera effect just to create this feeling of, of bliss, how wonderful that world is that they created, which Selma Hayek says because of automation, 
uh, bi- bi- biochemical changes or, or, or synthetic biology. So it says it asteroid mining. Yeah, right. So the blissful blue crystal world certainly seems much more like an illusion than the real world that they're telling you is an illusion. Everything's wonderful. Oh, look, somebody's just over here painting because they don't have to work anymore. And here comes a friend uh, that we haven't seen, and he's with his wife, but his wife is projected as a hologram. And, and he's like, what's this all about? These ghost people everywhere. He says, oh, it's um, – I don't know what she says, projected something. Like the person's home. They'll go out to the uh, to the store with their husband. The husband will go. They'll go with, but they're, they're at home. It's just a projection of themselves so they don't have to leave the house. And, but but you, you get a sense it's like ghost people, and that's really not happening. So I'm getting the sense I'm going – the movie initially presents this blue crystal world of bliss as the real world, the next layer up. But the evidence is this world is, is fake. I mean, this world is, is, is maybe it's, it's, it's a, it's a flip flop. This could be the simulation. You want you to believe this world up here is real. It has this dreamlike quality, especially with these colors dancing about and the real world you know, which they say is a simulation, the orange crystal world, like our world, that, that could be the real world. It, it just, everything is inverted. So potentially th- this is inverted in the movie, if that made any sense. Another incredibly important part as Selma Hayek is explaining to Greg, uh, Owen Wilson, the brand new wonderful world that he's just come out of the experiment is experiencing. Um, you know, she talks about, we did it through three things, like I said, automation, et cetera, synthetic biology. She says, um, well, you know, you have to experience, how did she put it? It's, it's not, it's counterintuitive in, in the extreme. How did, we have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. Yeah, that's what she is. We have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. And he says, well, don't you mean the opposite? Don't you mean you have to experience the bad to appreciate the good? And she says, exactly. That's very confusing. It's a very important part. You, Greg, and they're sitting around these lounge chairs, and the weather's wonderful. You have to experience the good, the bad. No, no. You have to, see, it's so counterintuitive. I'm getting confused. You have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. And then he says, well, don't you mean the opposite? She says, exactly. It doesn't make sense what she said because up to that point, the entire movie, the entire – purpose of her whole scientific endeavors and experiments is to get people to go into this brain box to experience the illusion of living homeless in Los Angeles, to go through that for lifetimes or weeks or however long you're there. Then when you emerge back, you're like, oh my gosh, this world is so wonderful. I can't believe I even complained. And there's a they make a point about the complainer that he was using this pool. There's a pool out back that's you know carved out of ancient they used ancient Greek ruins or something to make this pool. It's this wonderful old stone block. And he would complain about the temperature. You know, it's this wonderful pool. Well, so what if it's a little chilly? The overall purpose of going through the brain box experiment is when you come back, you'll never complain about the trivial again. Bad example because he's the one thing he does complain about again is the pool. But just as an example, you would never really complain about the trivial once you come back from experiencing the hell that the brain box showed you living in 2021 Los Angeles. Uh, there were no face coverings, at least the way 2021 Los Angeles was presented. That would have been an additional layer down of hell that Greg didn't experience, but you understand what I'm saying. Of course, at this time, I don't know exactly what to make of you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad when it should be the other way around. The only thing I keep I keep being drawn into is the episode of Star Trek um, with Janeway, what's that, Discovery, where there's a Q, not the Q that everybody knows, the all-powerful godlike being Q. There's another Q that's introduced in this episode of Star Trek Discovery who wants to kill itself. And at first it's like, well, you can do anything. You can snap your fingers, go anywhere in the universe, create anything. It has unlimited power, but it wants to kill itself. And the whole episode kind of shows Janeway and the Star Trek crew. If you knew, like, once everything is perfect and you can do everything and you've seen everything there is to do, then it's logical you would want to kill yourself. And we can't really, it's very difficult for we all powerful beings to kill ourselves. And it, you know, throws the entire Q continuum off. So he's imprisoned for eternity inside this 
this asteroid, which is like his prison. He's like, all I want to do is kill myself. So again, the humans don't understand. You can snap your fingers and go anywhere in the universe. That's the most exciting lifetimes about a trillion over a normal human life. Why would you want to kill yourself? And he's like, I can only show you a representation of what the Q continuum is all about. And they, he snaps his fingers and the Qs and Janeway and some of the crew, I guess, go into this. This, this is like a desolate, desolate desert town and there's just nothing going on. Tumbleweed, one gas station, people just rocking back and forth like zombies on the porch, reading the same book. Like nobody has any expression, just lifeless people, nothing going on. And he's like, this is a representation of what our life is. Once you've been around hundreds of millions of years or billions of years, you've done everything. You've experienced everything. This is what life is. There's nothing left. I just want to end this life. So is is the, that's the only thing is that's what's being said. You have to uh, you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. Now you know that is that that also people would say that's why Q was bored with his life. The Q that the popular character from Star Trek he kept trying to get involved with all the little petty little crap that Star Trek. Enterprise and Picard and all that was going on because he just was so bored. He was so bored. And that also, this concept kind of relates at the end of the movie Bliss where um, they're surrounded by the police, something else happened, and they have to, they, it seems like they're going to try to get back to the, the Blue Crystal world. They had to go back to the Orange world, the Hell world for whatever reason. And at first he's like, Owen Wilson's like, I can't go back. No, he's like he's like I can't stay here. I can't stay here in this in this twenty twenty one Los Angeles. This simulation. He believes at that point it's totally a simulation. He's like I can't stay here. I got to get out of here. But of course they don't have enough crystals. They need so many twenty blue crystals. And they only have whatever twelve or fifteen. They don't have enough for both of them, Selma Hayek and Greg, to get back. And at first he's like I can't stay here. You know, Selma Hayek, you're you're going to be caught by the cops. I'm going to take these blue crystals. You led me into this. I'm out of here. But then. Just in that scene, there's like a Butch Cassidy, the end of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid going on. They're being surrounded. The cops are closing in. It's a desperate situation. And they didn't do a great job in the movie. They needed more time to have this play out. But he completely changes his attitude. Like she's crying. She's saying how screwed they are because one of them's going to have to go to jail. They don't have enough crystals to get back to the real world. And he's like, what's happening now is like the emotion we're feeling for each other the situation it's a very what's happening now is a very beautiful thing and just in a matter of a minute in the movie he changes his opinion he's like no no no. now i want to stay what's happening now this butch you know standoff at the end of butch cassidy and the sundance kid where they're going to make their final last stand and uh, they're both going to eventually be killed and he's, he's like there's beauty in this what's happening right now and um, it's very strange, and they, you know, he, why would you go from wanting to get out of there back to the Blue Crystal world to one minute later seeing beauty in this situation where the cops are closing in? But they, you know, hey, it's a movie, and maybe they have a time limit or a budget limit, whatever. But the point is, he's seeing all the crap that we have to go through in this orange crystal life, and the pain, and the suffering, and the anxiety. He's like, there's beauty in this. Because, you know, the movie might be saying you have to understand that your spiritual self or might be more like the Q. You've been everywhere. You've done everything. You can't experience the emotions you're experiencing. There's beauty in this. You have to um, – it's so counterintuitive. I can never get it right. You have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. So if our lives, our spiritual selves outside of, of this place are more like the Q – uh, continuum. We, we've been everywhere, done everything, uh, been around since time in memoriam, um, always was, always will be, uh, no fear of death because we know we can never die. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, you, 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 you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. And, you know, all, it's in terms of with the message the, that movie's making, if I'm interpreting this right, maybe, I know it's a stretch, is all the things we complain about our anxieties, our stress, all the crap that the minions put on us and, uh, you know, the sea thing and the, the power is going to go out and the dark winter and all the, you know, all the, you know, people are in personal pain 
and have people have personal ailments. Um, uh, I th- one of the main messages the movie might be sending, if you really look at it deep enough, is you can't experience this stuff anywhere else, even if it's pain, even if you just burnt your fingers, you know, in your fireplace or whatever, trying to move a log and a coal flew out and just sizzled your hand. That's horrible. But one thing this movie could be saying, and it's a little bit of a stretch, but there's no easy way to interpret this movie, is, dude, you can't get this experience in this blissful place. It's just so, everything's so perfect. You get bored with that shit. And the movie presents it. No, no, you, you've got to experience this hell of Los Angeles to experience. Yeah, but there's another level to it where to me it might be saying no matter, in, you know, no matter almost no matter how bad your pain is here, it can be a beautiful thing. If you only knew you can only get that flavor of ice cream here, if that makes any sense. Switch it up a little bit. Another major, major theme of this movie that I think is going to escape most people, uh, most people will say, you know, which world is the correct world? Um, no, the blue crystal world of bliss, that's the real world because he emerges from the experiment. But, but it might not be that simple. Um, both worlds may have equal standing. It could simply be a shift in dimensions or an aspect, two aspects of Greg are in two different places at the same time. There's no rule that says one has to be real and one has to be fake. Um, there is a convergence of worlds. After she makes her presentation about the brain box and how Greg went back and now he's emerged as a whole new person that doesn't complain anymore because he experienced the health of Los Angeles, there is a um, – the worlds start merging together. And in this beautiful, blissful party where the wine is perfect and the, you know, the, the marble floors and the columns and they're in some Greek-looking amphitheater place, all these protesters start coming in. Like, you know, the protesters we would see on the, on the evening news. Um, and and I, it's very quick. Their signs flash for just a second. I froze some frames and it's complaining about the banks and the elite and the banking system. But it, it doesn't really matter what the complaints are. It's a merging of worlds. All the discontent and the horrible nature of the orange crystal world, the original world where the movie started, which is a parallel to or representative of our world, that merges into the blue crystal world. And Selma Hayek and uh, Greg, Owen Wilson, are like, what's going on here? There's like the worlds and, and they're like, you know, we caused this somehow. We didn't take the dosage right of Blue Crystal. We caused this world to blend, one world to blend into the other. And see, that kind of throws the experiment out right there. Where you say, no, Matt, the Orange Crystal world is just the brain box experiment. You see Greg gets into the chair just like Neo gets into his chair. He goes into the Matrix. Greg puts the tubes up his nose. He goes in. Well, if it was simply the brain box experiment, the entire orange crystal world is only when one goes under into the brain box experiment. Well, then how do you explain a merging of worlds in the middle of, of the party and the people at the party that live in the blue crystal bliss world? It's not like they're, they're ignoring the protesters and that all, all chaos breaks out that they, they run, they hide, they scream. It, it's, there's a merging. That scene shows you a merging of worlds, so you can't say one world is fake and one world is high, is is you know higher up or or creates a simulation. They both have equal merit. All right. Now the Selma Hayek character might not understand this, but there's no other interpretation of that scene towards the end where there's a complete um, merger of worlds. So much that so that he sees his daughter. His daughter's continuing to look for him, you know, checking all the skid row places, checking the homeless shelters. And she finds him in the after hours or the after uh, after party, after, after Selma Hayek presents her presentation on the brain box, the daughter finds him and the daughter's standing in her world. And like she's at a skid row center, he's standing in his world, which he happens to be in the blue crystal bliss world. And you'll see like a a pillar will be a beautiful Greek column and then the camera angle will change. And that column is just like some 
bridge underpass column with graffiti all over it, the same one. It's each, the objects are appearing in two different worlds at the same time. There is a parallel in terms of the way even the whole environments are laid out. When Selma Hayek is taking him for the first time into the uh, homeless uh, tent uh, establishment, tent camps for the homeless, they go by three mannequins that look like, you know, the Venus de Milo with the arms cut off, the famous statues, three kind of plastic mannequins, half burnt, you know, arms falling off, heads falling off. When she shows Greg um, certain parts of the bliss world after he emerges from the experiment, they walk by the same exact setting, but there are three beautiful Venus de Milo statues. Now, of course, there's a parallel. There's a, it's, it's saying what exists in this world exists in that world. It's kind of like an as above, so below. And um, there are a lot of parallels. Um, when they go into the tent city, there's a series of, of, of tents where different homeless people live. And it's kind of a corridor of tents. One homeless person throws him a beer at one point. He's like, hey, thanks. They, at the bliss world, they walk through a corridor of tents but it's a beautiful setting. Each tent is selling, one tent is selling olive oil, one selling figs, one selling, uh, you know, basket weaving, and everything's beautiful. And somebody throws, instead of throwing a beer, throws him a peach, a perfectly succul succulent, uh, you know, ripe peach, I think it is. And he's, he thanks the person in the same way. These worlds, um, it's it simply um, could be, uh, you know, two different dimensions or two different aspects of Owen Wilson in two different dimensions, like a, a reality overlay or reality overlap theory. It's not as simple as a simulation, but the way Selma Hayek explains it in the beginning of the movie, because why would a, a simulation would just be something completely different? If Matt was put in a simulation, well, then I might be living in a desert somewhere. I could be living in a jungle. It wouldn't like, you know, the, 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 the store on the right wouldn't look like the store on the right potentially of what I knew from, you know, my, my, my hometown, it would be completely something different. Like the way when they went into the matrix, that was no, nothing like the Nebuchadnezzar, but there's so many parallels. It's almost like the one world is simply a reality overlay of the other. And the more I think about it, the blue crystal world seems like a reality overlay of, of the more real world, the orange crystal world, if that makes any sense. A huge part of the movie also is the linear time problem. When he first meets Selma Hayek in the beginning of the movie and she brings him back to the tent encampment, the homeless encampment, she has to see his pictures. She sees a picture, a drawing of a woman. She says, that's me. And he's like, wow, it is you. I drew, how did I draw you? And he's like, well, we, Greg, we know each other. This isn't the real world. There's a whole other world. And that's, you know, you know that part of the story that they get to uh, when they emerge from the experiment. They are together. He thinks he doesn't know her, but he knows know her. But here's the point. He draws her in a certain pose. It's a very specific, sexy pose. She's smoking a cigarette. She has like an arm over her head. And, um, you know, it's reminiscent of the, of the pose that um, Rose did for Jack in the Titanic, but she wasn't posing naked, lying down, that sort of thing. And... Um, See, when an hour later, when they return to the bliss world, they take the blue crystals, come out of the experiment, take the tubes from up their nose. You see Selma Hayek standing in the doorway in that exact same pose. And it's and they, it, the pose is such that it would never be at random, just her emerging from the door. Well, Matt, she emerged from that door a million times. He drew her before. No, no, her arms over her head. It's a very strange pose. So... How was it in the beginning of the movie? They're looking at a pencil sketch of Owen Wilson sketching her in a very specific pose that she hasn't done yet from a linear time perspective. She does it after they return to the Blue Crystal world without even realizing she's doing it. Just she's standing in the doorway in that fashion and the camera pans on her. And the whole point of that presentation in the movie is you want to, an hour or so in the movie, you want to say, that's what he drew in the beginning of the movie. Well, how did he draw at the beginning of the movie when she's doing it from a linear time perspective days later? 
So again, it's it's more uh, evidence that it's a merging of worlds, of of independent worlds, where there is no. It's not like they were in the blissful world and you went into the brain box and that was an experiment and it's just a simulation, Greg. This world's not real, you know. So, um, you know, Selma Hayek c- could be absolutely wrong about that. The brain box may be a way of getting somebody to experience this hellish world that we know, 2021 Los Angeles, but Selma Hayek, um, you know, there's problems later. You find problems with her experiment. She's not all knowing. She's not omnipotent. She might have it all wrong. She may have powers using the orange crystal in the world that looks like ours, but it might not be, it might not be completely fake. Like she thinks it is. It might simply be a bridge into um, a, an aspect, of, you know, an aspect of a real person experiencing multiple incarnations at the same time. It may be a bridge into a different dimension. It could be similar to Colin's speech at the end of Black Mirror Bandersnatch, where if you watch, you can Google it, uh, Black Mirror Bandersnatch, Colin's speech. And he's like, there's, you know, Colin's like telling this kid about how reality works. He's like, there's potentially a million versions of you experience. I don't know what he says. Thousands of versions of you all experiencing different things, but similar things is this version of you. It, all that matters is the whole. He says, you could, one of us right now is just going to jump off this balcony and, and die. One of well, somebody's going over. This is in Colin's speech, not in the movie bliss. He says, it doesn't matter in this reality. You know, people will mourn for me, whatever, but in the whole, this one little sliver reality, okay, there's thousands of you playing out all simultaneously, all at the same time. It doesn't matter in the whole. It's only, you know, it's only pushing your general reality. If I jump off this balcony and just kill myself, it's only pushing the trajectory of your general reality off course like one little tiny inch. So it doesn't matter uh, in the end of the day what happens in this one particular reality. All that matters is the whole. Now, from here, it's not too far of a jump to the movie Her and how. Uh, somebody I have conversations with back and forth, his name is Tony, describes the nature of a real person's incarnation. He describes it as a simultaneous incarnation where higher self is having multiple experiences at the same time um, across different times. You're just one aspect of what higher self is experiencing. This is similar to the scene in the movie Her where I don't think it's too much of a stretch. I'm not sure this is the intention of this scene in the movie Her. In the movie Her, Joaquin Phoenix, is he falls in love with his operating system, this wonderful, pleasant woman's voice that comes out of the new computer that he bought that has complete AI, artificial intelligence, the year's like 2050 or something, and he can put it on its phone, and he speaks to it as he walks through the park, even tries to make love to it, believe it or not. But at the end... He says to, you know, this operating system, he, it's just, a, it's just he, you know, he's, he's fallen in love with the operating system. And he says, why are you so distracted? Are you, are you talking to anyone else? She's like, yeah, I have to admit I am talking to someone else or others as I'm talking to you. You're talking to others as you're talking to me? He had been dating his operating system for months at this point. Every time he wakes up in the morning, how are you, Judy? Oh, I'm fine. How are you today, Ted? What are you going to do today? You just, you know, anyway, it's like the, uh, but it, it, it doesn't, he never puts his cell phone into real doll. He just, he just, it's just the cell phone. It's the, it's the AI and the pleasant voice coming out of the cell phone. She's like, well, I am having conversations with others. He's like, he's like offended. Well, you're my girlfriend. Like why you're talking to me, how many others? And are these others your boyfriends too? Yeah, I have multiple relationships. How many people are you talking to right now that you're having a relationship with? She's like, 650. So he said, imagine imagine a real relationship, a real girlfriend, where you find out, she, not that she's seeing someone else, she's seeing 650 people at the same time. This is what the operating system in her did to Joaquin Phoenix. Talk about feeling dejected. Oh my goodness. So, um, but it's a, it's a 2050 AI operating system that, that you know, is, has some sort of artificial intelligence in a 2050 lightning fast internet. It makes sense. But anyway, um, but this is similar to what Tony talks about the simultaneous incarnation, you know, how, how much of this is all going on at the same time? You know, how many incarnations does your higher self have, including you at the same time, which relates to Colin's speech 
in Bandersnatch. It's like we're, we're, there's thousands of you doing this all at the same time, which is somewhat related to a theory that I don't go there, that, that one of the seven accepted principles of how the universe works this is a Stephen Hawking thing. It's probably, it's, it's probably based on truth, but then it's a deception because it comes from Neil deGrasse and it comes from um, Stephen Hawking that every decision you make is a split off in the universe and one of reality goes one way and another goes the other way. So just if I decide to reach down and pick up this donut and take a bite and I'm just going to not decide it, but in another reality decided it, then the universe is split off. I, bullshit. Bull crap. The, you think of it in terms of your inner knowing, your inner tuning fork. Bull crap, Neil deGrasse. But that's probably – see, they'll present that stuff because there's – it's they'll take the truth and put it up close to a lie or put a lie – it's the other way around. They put a lie up very, very close to the truth. They'll present that nonsense, but you probably can analyze that um, to say, well, what part of that is a lie? What part of that is real? And what does that tell me about how the universe really works related to what we're talking about here? So in other words, the universe split off theory, it's like we should analyze that sometime and say, well, what, you know, it's a deception, but there's a, there's truth embedded in it. And what's the truth that we can take away from it? Maybe the stuff that we're talking about now. So let's take a break from the big themes we've been talking about and just highlight a really interesting part of the movie. In the beginning, after Selma Hayek has introduced Greg to his new powers using the orange crystals. They're running around, you know, causing chaos and floating objects and making people trip and doing weird things with the orange crystals. They're in a roller rink and making everybody trip and fall. And it's okay, Greg. These people aren't real. Do whatever you want to them. You know, rip somebody's head off. It's okay. And they get violent with these people. Greg makes a light fixture crash down on somebody. He's like, these people aren't real. They're rollerblading around having fun. Again, like I said, some guy comes by, he's a real jerk, just grabs his girl's butt, and he's like, he just points at him. He just trips, you know, flies, his roller skates fly up, cracks his head. He's like, it's okay, just fuck with him. They're not real. Well, they both turn, they both skate by Hillary Clinton. What do I mean? They turn and look, and there's an old woman with a walker coming out onto a roller rink with, a, with an assistant, like an aide from the nursing home. She has a, a, a four thing walker. Well, you think, well, why is she on a roller? Why is she trying to roller skate? I mean, she, again, has a four-thing walker, not a cane. And it's absolutely Hillary Clinton. Not – she didn't really make an appearance, thank God. But you know what I mean? Like it's supposed to look just like her, and it looks just like her. So when Selma Hayek looks over, and they're like skating around together, like holding hands like Rocky did with Adrian in the the first Rocky going around – She's, but that they both have skates on and Rocky, you know, Adrian had the skates on and Rocky's just sliding along next to her and the guy's yelling out five more minutes, whatever. But, um, the Hillary Clinton with her Walker, she looks at Selma Hayek and just really nasty shakes her head. Like, you know, I don't know, like you would to to disapproval, like, like shakes her head back and forth in a way that totally disapproves, like, like look, looking down at Selma Hayek or it's just very, very negative and nasty. And it's absolutely meant to be Hillary Clinton. And I, I didn't hear what Selma Hayek said as she skates away. I had to go back like 10 times and turn it up all the, my TV up to a hundred, uh, the volume. And she says something like meddling bitch, Something like, or or what does she say? I've got to go see what she says because I, I spent forever trying to figure that out and I wrote it down. So hold on. Okay, after Hillary Clinton shakes her head in a nasty way, Helma, Selma, Helma, Selma Hayek skates away and she says, judgmental bitch to her to herself or, or to, to Owen Wilson. It's a loud, crowded roller rink. You, Hillary Clinton character can't hear that. Judgmental bitch. And then he turns, she turns to Owen Wilson and says, take her down. Take, you know, remember they have all these powers. Take her down. And I think Owen Wilson's like, well, this is an old woman. He's like, she's not real. These people aren't real, Greg. Take her down. And Greg points at her and like feet go flying out and she cracks her head, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, wait a second. What is this scene doing in here? You know, what is the – even – you want to – I mean, this almost proves this movie's riddled with some sort of truth. Why would you make that – where did that scene come from? I mean, an old woman who just happens to look just like Hillary Clinton, judge shakes her head in disapproval. Selma Hayek lashes out, judgmental bitch. I mean, where does where, what's the point of all of this? The only thing I can get out of it is again the theme of that scene, or the main part of that scene is only two. You know, Isabella jo, Selma Hayek would say, "Greg, there's only two real people here." 
fuck with all these people, make them fall. If somebody breaks their neck, it doesn't matter. It's all simulation. It's all fake. That is the purpose of the, of that scene. And just have fun with it, Greg, because it's all fake. And I think at one point he says, well, I killed my boss. His name was Bjorn. I don't have to feel guilty about that. And he's starting to understand that this world, it's early in the movie. He's starting to understand this world is fake. Well, as we talked about, it might not be that, might not be as fake as we think, but that's what we're led to believe early on in the movie. And he's like, I don't have to feel guilty about Bjorn that I killed him. She's like, no, they're all fake here. So that's the purpose. So then, okay, here's Hillary Clinton. The attached message is Hillary Clinton, this character playing this role, is fake. She's playing a role in the roller rink, but it's supposed to be Hillary Clinton. She's fake, all right, not real. And that's, you know, what does that lead me to? What we've said many times, we are a different type of incarnation than the minions of the jerks of the, of the um, you know, the a-holes that run around thinking they, they you know, maybe they do own this place. But then it's, a, you want to talk about a big fish in a small pond, hey, a-holes, you're a big fish in a small pond. It's like a giant big mouth bass in a toilet. You ain't nothing outside of this place. You ain't shit. And it's kind of the message. That's the message I get in the rollerblading or the roller skating rink. You know, it's like these people are all fake. They're all role players. So anyway, it's very interesting and, and, and very – it's so interesting because there's no place for it in the movie to – Anybody watching at first level or popcorn corn cruncher or all the movie reviewers that be like, that movie's about opioid addiction and mental health issues. I, I should just get into why, why a lot of people say that. Let me, let me discuss that next and address – see, it's, see that they have to put that in there because the popcorn crunchers need something to latch on to. They ain't going to see the shit that we talk about. Okay, if you go watch some movie reviews about Bliss – They'll be talking about opioid addiction, mental health issues, and they'll make every excuse in the world how this movie's about that. Now, one of the couple things they latch on to in the opening scene where he's in that you know horrible job or the telemarketing company he hates, he's trying to get his prescription filled, and he's desperate to get it filled. He really wants it filled, and it turns out from the daughter and the son that dad is, complains about all his ailments. He'll complain his knee hurts. Then he'll complain his shoulder hurts. And all the, and you figure, okay, maybe it is an opioid addiction because he has these Ill ailments. He's trying to get this thing filled. So they'll latch on to that. The other thing they latch on to, and I'll give him more credit for the second one, the entire movie revolves around, um, and I don't mean revolves around from subject matter perspective, but from a physical locale perspective. Whenever they're in the, quote, our world, orange crystal world, uglier world, they are always walking by this rehab center. I forget what it's called, like last chance rehab center. It just pops up all over the place. They take a walk here and they walk by it. They get, you know, he's homeless. He gets fast food out the back. Somebody helps him out and gives him some fast food because they think he's homeless and he has become homeless at this point. Then across the streets, the homeless shelter. Um, it's clear if you watch closely when he tries to contact his daughter, he makes the call from the uh, – it's not a homeless shelter. It's a rehab center so that people like the first level movie reviewer of Popcorn Crunchers like, there you go. You got the first scene where he tried to get a refill and then that damn uh, rehab center pops up all over the place. So just from that, you're going to talk about all this this stuff about matrix reality, what world is real, emerging of worlds, all this high-level complicated stuff. But see, they don't understand the, the popcorn crunchers. They just have to fit it into the damn bookends. And it's like, what's between these bookends? I don't know. It's like a half millimeter between the bookends. I don't know. The only thing that fits in, what fits in? A couple oil, opioid pills fits in. So that's it. That's what it's got to be about because it's, it's got to fit in between my bookends. That's all they can latch on to. They would have, they would listen to this review and think I'm absolutely out of my gourd. Well, so would a, if a gerbil listened to this review, they would think I'm out of my gourd. I mean, so I'm not, you know, what are you going to do for these people? They don't see what we see. I guess I shouldn't be so condescending, whatever. They just, but people need to think a little bigger. The only thing that I can understand is opioid addiction because of that damn rehab center. So all this crazy shit that goes on in this movie, I'm just going to all put it into that same little box. Are you freaking kidding me? Okay, guys, at this point, I'm just doing scene by scene, truth drops, whatever might be presented as a, as a strange show of truth, like the Hillary Clinton thing. So the next one, I'm just kind of bouncing all over the place, is um, they are arrested after the roller skating rink thing of making people trip and at least a version of them is arrested because the Selma Hayek and the Owen Wilson that comes out that kind of steal a code and run out the back or whatever, 
they see themselves get arrested and put it, get put in the back of police cars, see themselves drive away with the police. So you're standing with the version of Selma Hayek and Owen Wilson that are walking away scot-free. They see themselves getting arrested. That's never addressed because when you see out of Owen Wilson's eyes as he's riding in the back of the police car, he drives by the person that should be himself, but he just sees a bum standing on the street but dressed the way he was dressed. So you know, there's some weird diversions of reality or different aspects of self. I, I don't, you know, who knows what the message, it's so weird there. It's not even, it's so weird that part of the, of the movie, it's not even worth talking about. But when the uh, scene changes, they're getting released from jail. So now we're not no longer with the Selma Hayek and, and Owen Wilson that got away scot-free. We're now riding with the Selma Hayek and Owen Wilson that w- was taken to jail. And he comes out of the jail all happy. He's meeting up with her again. He's like, I didn't give them my name. I didn't give them my name. It's a big thing. And then there's just there's another truth drop in the movie. And Thor, our, our buddy Thor, trying to figure out all the the ins and outs of straw man and separating from legal fiction and straw man would be very happy about this. And she's like, yeah, you didn't give them your name. They can't, f- they can't F with you if you don't give them your name. It's kind of hard to understand when she says that, but it's kind of like it relates to people that study the legal fiction and separating from the straw man. And she says, you know, they can't F with you if you don't give them your real name. Or Greg was not – Greg in this example refused to operate through his legal fiction of at least what that world was. He didn't say, I'm Greg so-and-so. I work at so-and-so. I'm going to say I work there hoping they still think I work there because I was fired today and I killed my boss. And he's just, he just, he said, and he was so thrilled. He's like, I didn't give him anything. And it was like a big moment in the movie. Truth drop? Yeah, probably. Okay. The rehab clinic plays such an important central role in this movie. It would be uh, really bad of me to get the name wrong. It's called Safe Harbor Rehab Center. And the movie ends there, but I'm not quite there yet. The, the, it's called Safe Harbor Rehab Center. A meaning in the title related somehow? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but it, yeah, it's related somehow. I forget who sent me this email, but it was it was well put. It's like, Matt, what if uh, I'm expanding on the email that was sent? Uh, it, it was just a few sentences, but this was the, the gist of it. What if this movie was put out to be understood in two completely different ways for two completely different groups? And the message was like, you're in the middle with everything you've researched trying to make this bridge. But it wasn't supposed to be. There's not supposed to be a bridge. For example, someone might say this movie, in terms of we talk about the creeps in the back room of the back room of the back room that carry forth a certain type of knowledge and potentially their um, sequential incarnations, how uh, Melvin P. is not the same as you are and you know, there's some knowledge that they carry forth that they stole from the Library of Alexandria and all that. It's like this movie potentially matters. It's it's made for them. They have a whole understanding of, but it's kind of potentially a mockery because nobody they'll understand it, and not even I'm not talking like minion levels will understand it, like you know Oprah Winfrey or that. Not at that level. Ellen, I don't think would understand this movie. I'm talking the real hardcore pipe hit and you know people that control the world. And he's like, you're not meant to get it. You're not, you know, and then it's going to have a, a completely different meaning or the, or the popcorn crunch or the first level truth or it's going to have no clue as to what is being said here. And unlike movies where truthers have business in dabbling with the truth of it, um, this one potentially is not meant to be figured out. In other words, you might say you have no place in trying to bridge the two together, but I'm going to try anyway. But it is possible. And if I believe that it was put out, there's two different levels of truth. One level that only the hardcore back room, I mean, Jared wouldn't even understand. Just the people he serves to would understand. No low-level minion like Melvin P. and people playing a role or whatever. They're never going to understand it. I'm talking the, the back final back room. Um, if I get a sense that it was made for them, and it's just going to be a mockery to the popcorn cruncher, that's going to get me more interested in trying to figure it out, of course. Now, there is a factor here. I'll just mention it. I don't have this one figured out at all. Darla mentioned it to me, reminding me that that number 10, they needed 10 blue crystals. They needed to take 10 blue crystals each to exit 
the Orange Crystal World simulation, what looked like our world of Los Angeles. And they never, every time they always had, were short. They always were short the number of crystals they needed. I think in three different situations, they need a certain amount of blue crystals. And the blue crystals were posited, and, and somehow this is associated with the color blue, to exiting the matrix, exiting the illusion. You need 10 blue crystals. Darla said, remember, 10 is the number of completion is one of the main reasons um, they, you know, the, 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 not the, the seven eleven job application date, but the, the, the real number that I'm trying to say, um, boy, isn't that pathetic. We have to talk like that. Um, think of the, the, the real number that what's skipped 10 is skipped. It's skipping over the completion. It relates in a creepy way into their two into one religion. And by the way, guys, I didn't even mention this when I was talking about that amazing scene in clear and present danger that happened at the uh, one hour and 19 minute mark with the coding all over the place. I didn't even mention on one of the books is uh, two pillars into one of the books has two columns and then one column. It's the two into one religion, um, the, the merging of duality right there. And that's scene at the 119 minute mark of clear and present danger. So when I was talking about that scene, the most important thing I didn't even mention because the nine or the 11 to the nine or the nine to 11 coding wasn't, wasn't that uh, re, you know, it, well, it was pretty much in your face. The one of the, uh, it, but it, but it, it, it wasn't even worth talking about without the two pillars merged to the one as it presented in one of those books. And I forgot to mention that. So sorry about that. One other thing that happens in the bliss world where Greg has come out of the experiment and he's, Whoa, this world is so wonderful. The blue crystal world is, um, you know, he's experiencing everything for the first time and you know, world life's so wonderful and she's like, we've got to go back and we've got to continue our experiment, Greg. You've, you know, this is an experiment we're conducting. I've got my lecture, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no. You know, Owen Wilson's like, no, let's just take a, a bite of the apple, a bite of the apple, another crunch of the apple for just one more day. Well, come on. Really? I'll give you three guesses as to what that's tying into somehow, but you're only going to need one. Anybody screaming at me saying, well, what does that exactly mean? Relating that back to Adam and Eve. And I don't know. I don't know. Trust me. I, in terms of this movie, how bizarre this ride is, I've just, I've got a lot of theories. I don't even have 20% of it figured out, but I think the breadcrumbs here are leading in the right place. I think we're worlds away from the, the idiots presenting the opioid addiction movie reviews. One thing that's pretty interesting uh, regarding the bliss world, the blue crystal world is Greg uh, Owen Wilson apparently has a major invention in this world called the thought visualizer. And he doesn't, of course, remember any bit about it. He knows, he knows nothing about what's supposed to be the real world, but he remembers everything about what's supposed to be the fake world, the orange crystal world. Selma Hayek comes running out. She's like, this will bring back your memory. You're going to remember your baby. He's like, I don't know what that is. It's like just a TV screen. And she puts it down. He's like, well, what is it? He invented it, knows nothing about it. It's the thought visualizer. Just think of something. He thinks of a dinosaur wearing a swimming trunks or whatever, and just little etch a sketch, pencil sketch things, whatever. A uh, dinosaur jumps in a pool, just whatever he thinks of. Um, in this case, he's saying out loud because it's a movie. But you think, okay, well, this is supposed to be the real world, and you know, well, how's this thought visualizer? How does this TV screen pick up on everything he's thinking? Maybe this isn't the real world. The only possible way. It makes sense is, remember, Selma Hayek said, well, we changed our world based on three things, automation, synthetic biology, and asteroid mining. You know, just threw that in to make it seem all futuristic. The synthetic biology of these people could be such where they're all chipped and they, you know, immediately can communicate their thoughts to the TV screen, which is the thought visualizer. It's just kind of a funny gag thing. And I mean, even who, who makes an appearance, that monster? Um, what's his name? Um, the science guy, you know, whatever that clown's name is. The science guy is in it. He's like, have you ever said to the thought visualizer, I'm in a pickle? It's so funny what, what it produces. So the only thing that makes sense if there is anything about the blue crystal world or the bliss world that's real is they're a synthetic biology. They're all, they're all chipped up where they can immediately communicate. Other than if, if that's not the case, then it's just another case that this blue crystal bliss world 
And there's a lot of cases that can be made that the bliss world isn't very real at all. Okay, let's talk about Isabel or Isabella Sel- Selma Hayek's character in the ugly world, our world, Los Angeles, Orange Crystal world versus the bliss world. Two different people. When much, much more fun, interesting, cool, mystical person in our world, the Orange Crystal world. She looks ragged, hair's ragged, not dreadlocks, but that kind of look. Looks, you know, she hasn't showered in a few weeks, but she's much more fun loving than she is as a serious doctor in the real world, the bliss world, doing her brain box experiments. Now, it's not supposed to, the way they present this, guys, it's not supposed to change personality. So what's going on there? She's much different as soon as she comes back or what she is kind of like, hey, let's have fun, makes weird gestures and just has fun. Hey, we're arrested, laugh about it and weird sayings and she just acts different and I don't know, she's just much cooler than it's supposed to really be her. Greg kind of acts the same in both places, but there's a total change in uh, the Selma Hayek character between the blue crystal world and the orange crystal world. And I keep saying that just to differentiate between the two worlds, but the crystals, this is a major part of this movie too. The crystals only exist in the supposed simulation, fake world. Um, At one point, Greg says when they're in the blissful place, well, let's just get some blue crystals. She's like, no, they don't exist here. We have to get them back in the sim, back there. It's like, they don't exist here. How's that? It's like, and she shows him the, you know, the brain box, these brains floating around in a, like a big fish tank, just brains and neurons floating around a fish tank. The experiment is they're all in these lounge chairs surrounded these brains with these tubes plugged up their nose and tentacles that extend up the nose into the brain of the person under the experiment that in some way are linked to the brains in this floating, the brains floating around in this big fish tank called the brain box. She says, well, they're made, they're they're not really made in the simulation. They're made in there. They're made in the brains or the consciousness, the the blue crystals needed to exit the, the matrix, exit the illusion are made in there. So, they can't go directly into the brain box. It's, I know it get a little con- confusing for those that haven't seen the movie. It's just a very important point that the crystals, blue or orange, only exist in this first world in Los Angeles. It's supposed to be our world. They don't exist uh, for some reason in the world, which is I call the bliss world. It's significant, and I don't have that one figured out yet. I guess I don't have a lot of it figured out yet, just doing the – presentation of points or key considerations probably get it a little bit more figured out on uh, if we ever do this one more time separate issue when selma hayek is explaining the nature of her research to greg in the bliss world and she is um, making a speech to an audience about the results of this brain box and the concept uh, is quote end quote of the brain box is ugly simulated worlds to generate appreciation. If you go under the brain box, you experience ugly simulated worlds to generate appreciation. Of course, the ugly simulated world is exactly what we have at our window in 2021. Then that, of course, gets one to think that, of course, that level world is the real world, and it is just a simulation to appreciate what you have when you come back. Okay, again, that is the first level interpretation. I think there's another level here. Um, Well, Matt, you just look for other things and try to make it more complicated. Uh, Okay, maybe, but I really don't think so. I sniff certain things, okay? And usually when it's that, when you have a movie like this and there's certain concepts presented that are so simple, but there's a whole host of other things going on, it isn't that simple. So at one point, uh, she says in explaining to Greg what she's doing and the nature of her experiments when they're back in the bliss world, she says to Greg or Owen Wilson, bliss can only be achieved by a total understanding of the opposite state of mind. Bliss can only be achieved by a total understanding of the opposite state of mind. Well, you know, it screams <laughs> the, the, what, the dual, dual, dual nature, the duality 
uh, how this whole realm is designed around the basis of duality. Bliss can only be achieved by a total understanding of the opposite state of mind, which potentially, in this case, an opposite experience, what they call the simulation, could potentially produce an opposite state of mind. But there's a whole lot more here uh, in this quote that uh, I certainly haven't figured out yet. Guys, if I already talked about this, I'll be as brief as I can. But if anybody is screaming at this that I'm just looking for too much, and why do I think that, why do people like Matt think movies like this have to contain this secret underlying metaphysical truth? And we've been over this before. Why do we believe this absolutely comes from not five movies, like 500 movies? We know it does at this point. I don't need to make that argument. But one thing that proves the nature of the beast that you're dealing with, the nature of the type of movie and the message that's being delivered, is when tiny little things in the background are embedded, when you would never see them unless you pause, unless you look for them. And there's two major examples. One is when the after the, the, the after party, after she makes her presentation to the audience in the bliss world, when the worlds collide, he sees his daughter which maybe causes the worlds to collide, the ugliness and the protests and the rioting and the throwing of Molotov cocktails collides with the bliss world of everybody being served perfect Cabernet Sauvignon after the presentation by by a doctor and the worlds are colliding and falling apart. Um, he sees his daughter, but there's a part just for a split second in the back on, it's a split second. You have to pause at the exact right half a second and it says, which world is real? It's written in graffiti. You can't even read it. It takes a while to, if you're just staring at it to read. It's, it's all blended into a graffiti as the worlds are, are colliding. Which world is, is the real world? Now, this movie, every little detail, it has every little detail like that, which tells you something about the nature of the movie. A term I'm going to adopt for the future is, you know, the, uh, the older guy that opens Jurassic Park, forget his name, but he's like, spared no expense. Every, he, how many times does he say that in Jurassic Park, the original? Spared no expense. Spared no expense. So a movie that embeds every little detail coded that could only be picked up by truth or jerks like me pausing every two seconds, I'm going to say that movie spared no expense. And I don't mean the expense of it. They spared no effort expense in putting in these tiny little details. Here's a major example of this. There's this diamond logo that appears all over the place, especially in the orange crystal world. So initially when Selma Hayek is leading Greg into their open the gate or the fence to get into the uh, tent city where the homeless people live, where Selma Hayek lives on the pillar that's holding up a bridge or something that live next to the LA river is this diamond, like, uh, I don't know what you call it, a stencil or it's painted on one of the pillars. The diamond is composed of five triangles and the the top is a square but it's it's four triangles that create an x now this diamond p appears all over the place very subtly very subtly and there's something being said here i have no idea what it is but the absolute guarantee of its significance is in the pencil sketch one of the most important parts of the movie the pencil sketch of what greg draws up uh, of the house, which he's, it, the, this house is in his mind and this other world that seems real to him in, in the opening of the movie. Why does he keep focusing on this environment? And he's sketching out the house and the pool and he sketches Selma Hayek. She later, you know, they look at the sketch and she says, look, Greg, you drew me. Well, when they focus in on that sketch, he has sketched in the same diamond, which is made up of five triangles basically five, six, seven, eight, nine triangles, but the top four triangles in the middle form a, uh, an X, an X. Now this thing c comes up all over the place, but if you, if you pause the pencil sketch, you have to pause it, like be some truth or jerk trying to look for every detail like me. You see he's put this diamond in the pencil sketch, the original pencil sketch of Selma Hayek, and it's like faded into the background of the pencil sketch. So... There's huge significance in it. The last scene in the movie with the different, there's the X, there's the, uh, Darla pointed out the square, 
and the different shapes in the last scene of the movie where he gets together with his daughter. There's significance in that. But I thought that, to me, might be a different representation of what this diamond represents. But nevertheless, guys, I know you're not following what I'm saying, and I don't even understand the significance. I'm just saying when there's subtle little symbols that you can find that the first person watching it or, or somebody watching it the first time would never see one of them, where if you watch it closely, you can find this diamond pop up in five or six different places, just subtle in the back, shown for only a second, and only if you pause it. See, there's, there's a reason for all of this. It just mocking the truth community, knowing some jerk like me would break it down and come to false conclusions? Maybe, but I don't think so, Okay. You know, their jerk role here ultimately is to benefit us, right? It's not just about mockery all the time. That's that's first grade horse shit. Another really important part, but absolutely bizarre, is when after the presentation in the Bliss World and the party, right before the worlds merge, um, Greg sees his daughter for the first time. But before he sees her, she's looking down at him in the party. And, okay, she's presented as a, um, they called an FGP, a fake generated person. We call it an NPC. But as he's, she's looking down on him, like the wor- worlds are com- merging, there's somebody standing next to her, somebody we don't know at all in the movie, who says, I wouldn't get near him, ma'am. He could be unpredictable. I wouldn't get near him, ma'am. He could be unpredictable. Well, nobody in the bliss world should be able to communicate with her. I, it was very strange. Like who is, who is saying that to her and why it means something. I don't have the answer right now. The only way to have a chance of understanding a bit of the message of this movie, it's not opioids is to comprehend the end of the movie. So let me walk you through the end in the bliss world. After she gives her presentation, I mentioned there's this merging of worlds what was a beautiful, serene party with harps being played. All of a sudden, these protesters march in and the violence we see on the streets in this world emerging, a colliding of worlds. So one world that has violence and people protesting and turning over cars is merging with the bliss place. And Selma Hayek grabs Greg's hand. And they start running and he's like, what's going on? And she's like, I don't know. I think we might have caused this, this merging of worlds. We have to go back. I, think we, I don't think she says, I don't think we got the dose right. We each didn't take 10 blue crystals, 10 for completion. I'm just saying that, 10 for completion, per what Darla said. 10 for completion, and we've got to go back into the simulation to kind of to fix it. He's like, well, why can't we just fix it from here? Why can't we get crystals here? He's like, there's no crystals here. You have to go back. We can't get the blue crystals only exist in that world. So she convinces Greg they have to go back to somehow fix it. Now, How's that going to happen? I don't know. But nevertheless, they go back. One thing leads to another. It is a movie that needs to be wrapped up, and this presentation needs to be wrapped up. Something happens where they're trying to get the blue crystals, where the cops are are after them. And they're kind of held up. It is very uh, reminiscent of the end of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Okay, they've gotten crystals, but they, once again, they still don't, they don't have what they need. I think they only, they don't have the 20 they need to exit. They need 10 each to exit the fake world. As they say, exit the simulation. Cops are closing in, surrounding them. And at first Greg's like, I can't stay here. You know, I don't, I got to go, I got to get out of here. But then, like I talked about earlier, there's this beauty in their situation. He sees the emotion and the love they're expressing for each other. And he's like, there's beauty in this. He's like, no, why don't you go? And then all of a sudden, he said, she should go. And she does. She inhales 10 blue crystals. The body drops over. And, um, you know, is that, a, is that, a, is that a, an illusion, a literary allusion to no longer need of the body? Her spirit is somewhere else in a heavenly, blissful place. She gets out and... Um, somehow, you know, I, I guess she attracts the attention of the police before she snorts her 10 blue crystals. Greg somehow escapes. Well, it's a movie, you know, there's no way he was being, they were being, the cops were closing in around him, but he has this epiphany. It's like, there's beauty in this, you know, the, like someone would say there's beauty in the way Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid went out, even though there was no shootout to the death at the end of bliss. He, um, maybe he thinks about his daughter. Anyway, he escapes 
the situation, and he finds himself in that same uh, rehab um, center. And Greg, would you like to speak? I'd like to introduce Greg. He's new here, a circle like an alcoholic's circle, and it's very uncomfortable. They just show Greg for like two and a half minutes, and he doesn't say anything. It's very uncomfortable the way they did this in the movie. He pulls out a picture of his daughter, and he says, this woman here believes I'm her father. And I believe she may be right because at this point, you don't, he doesn't know what's real and what's not, but he decides to stay in our world or in the orange crystal world to, to see, to see it through. And eventually he does meet up with his daughter at a park somewhere and she accepts him back very lovingly. And he decides to stay here and uh, Selma Hayek has now gone her way and whether they were married or very had an intimate relationship or not, you, you assume they will not see each other again. Now, in making his decision to stay and Selma Hayek to go to snort the 10 blue crystals, he makes a case for this place. What the way the movie presents it, Selma Hayek designed the really ugly simulated realm so you could appreciate the world or the wonderful world in which you live. He's like, this place is incredible. He's like, this is a beautiful thing. Look what's happening to us. One of us is about to die. The police could start shooting at any time. The emotion we're giving each other. He's like, he's kind of saying, this can't happen in the real world. There's beauty here. It's like, you never know what's going to happen. He's making a case for the beauty of the ugliness. It's like one day we're riding around the roller blading rink or the roller rink, tripping up Hillary Clinton and tripping people up. And then we got arrested and they didn't get our name and we got out. Then we had this incredible experience and that incredible experience. And then these thugs in this neighborhood came after us with a gun and we got out of that. And, you know, he's like, there's so much, it, it's, uh, it is ugly here, but it's beautiful. And he's mostly saying, we can't get this, can't get this experience in our wonderful world back there. No matter how effed up this is, you just can't get the experience. And that could be one of the main things of what life is for. But as I talked about earlier, even a pain of some kind, you know, in the right sense, if you really knew that you just can't experience that, even a pain, you know, frying your f finger on the stove or something, you could be like, this is, you know, in a, in a way, maybe it's a bad example, but in a way you could say, this is incredible. And he gets that sense at the end and he's like, no, I'm going to, I'm just going to experience everything that's here. And just an over overriding or overwhelming sense inside me that they present, the lab presents his daughter as just a FGP, a fake generated person or an NPC. And see, there's, there's such irony because every time they show her, she's acting the opposite of an NPC or an FGP. She's showing incredible love for her father, empathy or sympathy or incredible emotion and caring. And there's just, she, her in every sense of the word in each scene that the daughter is in trying to find her father or in some way care for him, she is not showing what an FGP would do. There's no way an NPC would do that. And even back in the lab, he sees her come up on a screen, his daughter, and they're convincing him that, oh, this is also all not real. And even the little lab technician says, some FGPs are more convincing than others. Like, even though she shows all this beautiful emotion, some are better programmed than others, kind of say. But but no way. But that's one of the, the ironies of the movie or the conflicts of the movie, that she shows so much caring that there's no no way. she not She could be... A potentially a different incarnation or something on a different spiritual journey, but no way it's just an FGP, some random generation of the brain box, um, you know, uh, scientific experiment. She's just some program on a computer. No way. Absolutely not. And um, they, they, you know, the, the her, her, his son might be, son doesn't kind of give a shit, this and that, but she's not. Okay. She's not. And what they present as a simulation the real messages, you know, real real things or spirits or souls can exist at this level of, as well, um, even if they don't have the same connection or bridge to another place like the uh, Owen Wilson or Selma Hayek character did. Um, spirits or souls are different different levels of 
of their, their journey potentially. I don't know, but that just stood out to me. And I said, I just, at the end of watching it the third time, I said, this, she's not, she's not an FGP. It's just in the, the and in the movie's clearly saying she's not an FGP. So what is the ultimate conclusion and message in this movie? I don't know. If anybody says they have it all figured out, just like somebody might say, I know exactly what as above, so below represents when there's like a hundred different interpretations. And if somebody has it all figured out, this movie, eh, they don't have it all figured out. And their, their, their theory is probably one level above the opioid addiction theory. But I can give you some hints or some guidance that I think will put us close. I, I will continue to sleep on this. It might take a few more weeks for me to form a final opinion, but I think this guidance is sound and it's not biting off too much. Of course, the story being about mental health and opioid addiction, um, well, w you know, without a clue is the, about the nicest way I can, I can present that. We'll move on. The first level truth would be, Matt, you know, that's why we're living this life, this very difficult 3D experience in this place called Earth. We are an immortal uh, aspect of something that always has been, always will be. And you just, you know, you're not going to appreciate the, the, what you have, you know, uh, worlds above the astral realms, unless you go through this 3D, very difficult slog through the bog. You experience all the pain and heartbreak and emotion of this 3D existence. And we have to go through this. It's a learning experience because it will help us uh, learn and appreciate the good. That's a very basic presentation in the movie that the movie makes it very clear because this movie is so all over the place and so bizarre. I don't think the first grade uh, truth interpretation, which is much better and high, much more advanced than the opioid addiction uh, interpretation by the, you know, uh, by the movie reviewers that think they, they have it all figured out. It's much better than that. Um, but you know, at least that incorporates the spiritual nature of self, but that's still, I think that's first grade guys. I really do. I think understanding this movie centers around the line of you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. And that's exactly what Greg did in the end. He was in the blissful world, you know, whether he was there just a few days, he got a sense of how everything worked. Nobody has any money concerns. Everybody's friendly. At the end, he wanted to stay. He wanted to seek out that relationship with his daughter or rekindle it. He wanted to stay. So you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. He hated his life in, quote, our world or the orange crystal world in the beginning. So he went and experienced the bliss and, oh, it's wonderful. And they're going sailing in another perfect day and nothing ever changes. And the wine's always perfect and the food never spoils in this place. And you have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. And as wonderful as that is, you know, he got a sense just being there a few days. He, he, it already started to wear on them. He, he started to complain about the pool. He was only there a few days. Of course, at first it seemed like going into the brain box and experiencing the bad made him appreciate the blissful world. But when he backed up far enough to him, it was just, it was just the opposite. That blissful world, nobody, you know, great. We'll just hang out by the pool and everybody explores their art. There's, he's like, this world is incredible. You, one day you'll, you'll get hurt and then something else will happen. And then you'll be up, you'll be on top of the world. Then you'll be down, you'll be lower than low. And then you'll, he says, this world is incredible. This, that, that world whether that be the real world or not, can't give you all of this stuff. And I, so I've, I've experienced the good and now I can appreciate the bad. This is the cops are closing, closing in on us. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. So, I mean, if you'd apply that to our lives, all we've ever known is for lack of better words, you know, this world, the, the bad in this example, of course, there's a lot of beauty in this world and we've, we've, latched onto that, the beauty of nature. We, we've never experienced this whole other world the way Greg did, this whole blissful world, a whole nother existence. If we, or we probably have, but we have no memory of it. Our memories have been wiped. Um, so how would that apply to us? You have to experience the good to appreciate the bad. Well, do you really ha have to experience it? Or are we 
big enough and capable enough to put ourselves in that ex experience, like the Q that was trying to kill himself, where if everything's perfect, you've done everything you, you can do, there's nothing that's ever new, it's the same old, same old, even though there's no death, no disease, every, the grass always grows perfect, the trees always grow perfect, the sun's always shining. It's like, well, look, nothing can happen to you that's new and exciting. I mean, you can put yourself into that state of mind, and it helps you then this world, you know, is, is pretty effed up right now. It, you know, you never know what's around the corner. You know, the, the beauty that he saw in that last scene, we can grab a little bit of that and incorporate that into our lives and make our lives, um, you know, we don't have to go through what he went through, being homeless and almost getting killed and all this stuff. But remember, it's all about that line. Greg appreciate Greg experienced the good. And that was boring ass shit, the, the good, you know, and he, now he had a whole new appreciation for the bad. And he's like homeless and living next to the L.A. River and he was loving it. And we're sitting here bitching about everything. I put us in a mask and I'm bitching about everything. We, you know, all the, you know, little stuff that we talk about, you know, you know. When I talk about every time I get in the damn shower, I say, I'm about to do something that 99% of kings and queens that ever walk the earth never will have the chance to do and never experience anything like it, you know? And so there's, a, so it, it is something, um, it's a very positive message at the end we can apply uh, to our, to our own lives, even if we don't truly figure out every aspect of what this crazy movie was trying to say. Thanks for listening. And I, I think I did what I set out to do so many months ago, do a movie review longer than the damn movie itself.